Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan and thank you for tuning in. My guest today is Vanya Rose, businesswoman and explorer. Vanya is the first woman to be elected president of the Explorers Club. In 2002, she was awarded the Medallion of Honor from the New York Council of the Society of American Registered Architects and is currently on the Grant Award Committee of the Charles Lindbergh Foundation and a fellow in the Royal Geographical Society. I'm delighted you're here, Fanya, truly delighted. I wonder if we could start with your telling us um, a little bit about the arc of your life, because without knowing it, it's been an unusual life. So start. Thank you, firstly, Julia. I wanted to say thank you for this invitation to have this conversation with you. This is a real privilege and pleasure for me to be in your beautiful drawing room and have time to spend with you. Um, yes, I have uh, happily had a, an unusual life. Uh, you mentioned you'd like me to start a little bit with my parents. Well, very briefly, my father originally was from the Ukraine. He and his family left uh, Berdichev in 1918 at the revolution. He was a small boy and went to Berlin. Um, in 1934, he decided he would like to go. He wanted to leave. He was uncomfortable with the situation there. And he, I believe, was walking to the boat to come to America when he met a friend who said to him, why go to America? You're on your own. Come to Africa and we'll go together. And that was how his decision to go to Africa. He arrived in 34, 35 uh, as a drummer and photographer. And because he was German, he had to um, join enlist in the army, South African army during the war. Otherwise, he would have been interned. And uh, after the war, he decided he would rather live under the British. So off we went to Rhodesia as a family. But I was educated in Johannesburg and briefly went to Wits University. And in, I then married Donald Golden in 1956, that's a long time ago. And in 65, my father was starting yet another business in Rhodesia and persuaded my husband and I that we should now take a full-time residence in Rhodesia where we opened the Victoria Falls Casino Hotel. Subsequently, to be Rhodesian, you wasn't an accident of birth. It was a state of mind. And we were Rhodesians and part of the Rhodesian Front, Ian Smith government. And sadly, in 79, my husband was killed in the Viscount crash. Um, and so in 1980, I took my four-year-old little boy and we went to live in London. And London was very good to me. Um, this may be of interest to your reader, to your viewers, um, because I have been a conservationist since 1965. And sadly, conservation isn't sexy. It's not rocket science. Now, people are going to perhaps be up in arms about that statement. But in the 60s, we could see 
that the orchids around Victoria Falls and the ferns and the plants were being destroyed. Now, if I may tell you, for any project, you need three things. You need passion, you need power, and you need money. And I can assure you, if you have those three things, you have a good project. Well, I had the passion for conservation. Donald was the chairman of the local council. Um, government at the time was also very conservation conscious. And fortunately, we had the money. So we initiated a lot of good things at Victoria Falls as early as the 60s on conservation. The herds were getting smaller, the plants were being destroyed, the orchids were being stolen. Um, sadly, I've left the country. I don't know if those initiatives are still alive, but we were very conscious of the natural world then. Um, so what was your life like in London? What did you decide to do? Well, that leads on to it a bit. I arrived there with a small boy, and um, I had to bring something that would be original to the table if I wanted to work for the big corporates. I also have to tell you that I'm actually a jumped-up secretary. <laughs> I went to Secretarial College. No, no. I went to the London School of Economics to do an MBA. And the young woman there said to me, look, you're a mature student and you will be competing with young people. So my advice to you is go and do a secretarial course. And because I had been involved in the family business for many, many, many years, she said to me, if you are as astute as you say you are, <laughs> then become a secretary and big corporates like to advance people within the company rather than always looking outside. And with that, I did go to secretarial school and I was a really efficient shorthand typist. I could do uh, shorthand, which served me well, and uh, type, and uh, decided that was the route I would take. And also with my conservation passion, I felt that Developments, you cannot stop progress in this world. And developments are essential to the economic success of any country, of any city. But if you look at the development from a conservation point of view, it's not always destruction. And fortunately, the two companies that I worked for in London, both Hamilton's and British airports, um, went along with that. We always looked at our big projects with the eye to conservation. And if I may bore you a moment with an anecdote, I'm not quite Please sure do. what I can say. Um, Stansted Airport was a Greenfield site development. And when we went to a certain bank, the one question the board asked me, they said, we believe there were some bee orchids on the ground. What has happened to them? And I was in the happy position to say to them, I've had a study made, and <laughs> as far as I know, they're blooming their little hearts out. And he looked at his board and said, we'll give them the money. And that's when I realized that the big corporates were becoming um, conscious of the natural world and of conservation. So I must tell you, I was in the money business in the UK. And um, during that time, I've always been involved with exploring, as you know, and in 
1999, I was elected to be the first woman president of the Explorers Club. Now, I must say this now. At the Explorers Club, we don't do gender, we don't do minority, we don't do religion. We do achievement and we do competencies and skills. And so, although I was a woman, and elected as the first president to be a woman, I felt sure I was the first, I was the best man for the job at that time. And um, one of your recommendees was Thor Heidel. How yes, did you was. connect with him? Well, again, because my husband, my first husband was in politics, um, I knew how to run a good campaign, I believed. And when you're running a good campaign, as you know, you don't write to everybody because not everybody's going to vote for you. That's right. So I, of course, wrote to the women, to the Europeans, because I lived in London. And um, strangely enough, I used the same phrase as our president. I wrote to them and said, I will be your voice on the board. And at that time, Thor Heyerdahl lived in Europe and he wrote to me and he said, I like what you say and I would like to sponsor you. So I had that huge honor to be sponsored by the greatest living explorer of his time and subsequently met him. What to drew him. you to these uh, mountain expeditions? Uh, you made at least two to very high places. Well, yes, I've been uh, Kilimanjaro. Oh, yes, I've done a lot of climbing. Well, my only um, comment can be Rhodesia is a landlocked country. So, of course, we had a lake, but sort of water was not quite my thing. And even now that I do snorkel, I'm always a bit afraid something will jump out. <laughs> so that's so funny. I prefer the good old ground, you know, where you put one foot in front of the other and you feel secure on the ground. And maybe have more options to escape. Yes, and uh, there's, there's less danger of something jumping out on you when you're walking. What drew you to come to America? Um, well, that's a family thing because I have huge sympathy with immigrants. Um, you have to go where you get papers. And after Don sadly was killed, um, and as it happens, Joshua and Coma said that he had arranged it. Um, the British government suggested that my son Andrew, who was four, and myself would be comfortable in the UK. However, we couldn't persuade either the British or the Americans to let me come here and be with my two older sons or for them to come to United Kingdom. And so they split my family. So it's, um, yeah. I have huge sympathy that you, you just do the best you can. For the best you can. And accept things the way they are. Interesting. So you're a British citizen now? But oh, not yes. a, but and not an a... American citizen. Because my second husband, Robert Rose, was American. So I actually have the luxury of two of the best countries in the world, the US and the UK. So what do you think drives you? Uh, you know, whether it's the casino at Victoria Falls or the uh, desire to know the animals or watch the orchids decline in number. What drives me? Curiosity? Yes. Um, because if you're an explorer, that's what you're always wanting to know what's at the other side of the mountain. Um, passion for the community, and that is a very wide statement.
because not only the people, but the natural world and the, the animals. And, uh, and maybe if I may tell you a family anecdote. Yes, please do. Um, my father had a number of businesses in Rhodesia, and one of them was a uh, rather elegant store. They sold beautiful jewellery, handbags, and silver, really quite special. So when I was 16, he said, and I quote him, everybody works in my family. It's the week before Christmas. I want you to go to the store. And I was delighted. You know, as you know, I always love beautiful things. So off I went, and he arrived and said, why are you standing at the counter? And I said, well, I'm going to serve the customers. He said, no, my dear, you are going to the cash office. And when I retired from BAA 50 years later, I told them I was still in the cash office. So it doesn't <laughs> matter what you call it, whether it's the cash office or the accounting or the treasury, I've always been in the cash office. So maybe my father inspired me, A, with hard work, attention to detail, and B, to the financial world. Put you where your talents were. Since the, he didn't like it that you were waiting for customers as opposed to perhaps reaching out for them. You've received so many awards in your life from all over. Which is the one you treasure? Well, um, I have always been that humble and felt privileged with all my appointments. It's always been a great pleasure for me. But the one that I regard highly is when Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs appointed me to the Jewish Association of Business Ethics because uh, Lord Sachs is an Orthodox rabbi, and he appointed me as a woman, and it said a lot about me as a person. All the other appoint appointments have said a lot about me as my achievements and my competencies and my skills, but I felt that he'd said about what he said about me said a lot about my integrity and about my position in the Jewish community, and I valued that a lot. Thank you for asking that question. Oh, most welcome. What did the, um, the, the appointment entail? What was the Jewish ethics that was discussed? Well, it was Lord Sachs' brilliant vision. And we used to go to schools with uh, actors, and they used to act one act scenes to try to inspire young people that business is about money, of course it is, and about success, but there also is a way to behave ethically in business. And, uh, he had pointed the top businessmen in London at the time. It was a very worthwhile project. Thank you. So it was a teaching or... And, and we the held films? lectures for the business community. Um, and as I said, students were taught. We had lecture series. We had... Uh, nice. It's very interesting indeed. Yes, and necessary. You know, it's always good to review things, to especially review behavior, the young people. Especially in business, from time <laughs> yes. to time, people do not behave in a right. way that is really They could, acceptable. for the better. Yeah. Um, you've had several times when you've had to readjust to a different culture. Have you learned anything about what's the most successful way of doing that at the beginning, middle, and finally integration? Um, well, have I learned anything about living in different cultures? Firstly, it's always interesting, and yes. people are kind. 
Um, and then I have to say that my religion has always been very important to me and I've always joined a Jewish community, a synagogue, and they're always inclusive and it gives one a base. But I think so. I think that's that once you have a base and a community and you reach out to people, you're inclusive. Uh, and then I've always thought that the most important thing is to, when you're moving on, you have to have courage because you're stepping into the unknown. You have to be bold. But what's the worst that can happen? You can go back to where you were, provided right. you have that. And option. I was lucky enough to have that option that I could always go back to Rhodesia, I could always go back to England or to South Africa. So just keep going. What I notice is sometimes um, cultures are different, um, not necessarily on how, what they talk about, but how they <laughs> Oh, <talk>. yes. <laughs> yes. America is very different to the UK. Uh, what have you noticed? I think I enjoy the euphemism of the UK. Firstly, I've always been in English-speaking countries, which makes it easier. I didn't have to learn their language. Second of all, I enjoy the euphemism of Broch, the colonial era, and the UK. It's not in your face and straightforward. You, you rather skirt around it and the command of the language is interesting. Yes. And I have noticed that perhaps people in America are a bit more straightforward <laughs> <laughs> than people in Britain would be. I mean, we're brought up to not to notice. So oh. we didn't and therefore not to comment. Not to comment because you didn't notice, of course. And of course, um, I was in the UK during Margaret Thatcher's time and I always use her as a wonderful example because imagine when she walked into number 10, she was surrounded by a cabinet of men who thought they could control her and they never did. And she was always well dressed, well spoken, very polite. And I think that I perhaps took the yardstick from her and thought that's the way to behave, just quietly confident and get on with it. And get on with it. So do you think she ignored the men? or Not she at all. She just cooperated? She just cooperated and she... Along her own lines. Correct. How will you put it? <laughs> yes, she just used her own lines. And... Well, it's a, yeah, it's... A, so what do you see now, forward? Uh, well, now, um, for me, it's a very exciting time. Um, I have my lovely family, but I'm also still involved with conservation. And in February 2020, all being well, we're doing a, a seminar and a day on the coral reefs because you know now the coral reefs are being destroyed and uh, there was a very good uh, report done on the 15 most pristine, pristine coral reefs and so we are taking action to try to keep them that way to see that they're not destroyed so I'm involved with that. And then again, with the oceans in March, there's a conference in London, catch the next wave. Again, oh. also of the ocean. And that's moving technology and the ocean. And I have concerns about that. Well, I'm not sure what it covers, but it's interesting well, they can even... I mean, the concern, my concern is they are now, uh, will be using submersibles that do not have oh, yes. people on board. Yes. They're using drones. Yes. Uh, I mean, when a very expensive piece of kit 
malfunctions and it's in the water and there are no people on board, there's no motivation to bring it back to the surface at huge expense. And my concern is that the bottom of the ocean will then become a garbage bin. Or disturbed. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Well, isn't that a wonderful time together with Fanya? So a few things that I took away from her wonderful talk is, first of all, she was lucky to have a father with high standards <laughs> who believed in work. Secondly, he never scalded, uh, scalded her when um, she wasn't selling uh, at Christmas time, but sent her to the back office. And he told her, everybody in the family works, so that's a good attitude to have. When later she was uh, trying to get things done, uh, she said on projects you need three things. You need passion, you need pull or power, and you need uh, money. So that's really sort of interesting to keep in mind. Uh, thirdly, I thought that um, the arc of her life, when I asked her what, what uh, motivates her in a sense, or what, she talked about concern for the community. And I think that seeing yourself as a server in life is really uh, kind of helpful. But also, she admired Mitch's Thatcher, be graceful, but persistent, and that's also a good way to be in life. So I thank you for tuning in this time. I thank you, Fanya. You. <laughs> and I, as I end every program, please go out and do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it every day till I see you again next week. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, that thank was wonderful. <laughs> to contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.